Okay, the next presentation is my own, uh, Cape Point Maritime Landscape, Heritage Tourism, Shipwrecks, Lighthouses, and Baboons. Um, and I'm going to spice it up a little bit. I'm going to show you a short um, video clip. Um, this is a South African National Parks, uh, I guess, advertisement for the park. Um, so it's a little commercial, so please um, bear with me, and I hope I can get this uh, technology um, operating. Let's see, this is going to be noisy. Uh, but this will give you a good idea of that landscape. Well, as you can see, this is a very um, rugged, dramatic landscape with the uh, surf crashing on the shores of the mountain slopes. Uh, and uh, the primary sources are peppered with people's um, sentiments about this landscape. Either they were inspired or filled with dread and awe. Um, and so the types of comments you see are the dreary desert and the horrid crags. Um, and these included visitors who came from the highlands of Scotland. Um, but others were inspired, and um, uh, La Vallée, a naturalist who visited the Cape in 1796, stood on this uh, promontory, and he described it as one of the grand spectacles of nature, um, with the Atlantic Ocean on the right and the Indian uh, on the left, and then below him was the uh, Southern Ocean. Um, Cape Point Nature Reserve is well known today, both locally and uh, globally, um, one of the most well-known Research stations is um, global atmospheric research and a number of um, climate centers in the park. Uh, it's also uh, a Table Mountain National Park, one of many, um, and uh, is huge. It comprises 7,750 acres, uh, 40 kilometers of coastline, and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, mainly for flora and fauna. And their claim to fame is that they have more diversity than the whole of um, New Zealand in the park. Uh, 250 bird species, the largest of which is the ostrich, um, 1,100 indigenous plant species, uh, mammals, antelope, zebra, 
um, predators like curricles. Um, and then cultural sites, uh, which have been studied um, very peripherally, but not in any depth. Um, and these include rock engravings, um, shipwrecks, lighthouses, World War II sites. And even though they fall within the um, jurisdiction of the park, the cultural resource managers, should there be a project, would be uh, SARA, South African Research Agency, and any uh, removal of artifacts for phase two would require an artifact repository agreement with um, Ezeco, much the way uh, that we work the Barto and the Brunswick. Um, for researchers, there's um, not a lot of housing. It's fairly remote. Um, beach houses um, right close to the uh, shipwrecks and two inland farmhouses uh, where our crew stayed, uh, but you have to take in your uh, supplies and food. Uh, most of the research data has been flora and fauna, particularly um, baboons, uh, who uh, the populations are very um, uh, successful, starting to encroach on each other. Um, as well as humans. Um, so the types of themes have been uh, spatial intertroop territoriality, um, sleeping site characteristics, human baboon conflict and spatial variables. And I think for the point of view of archaeologists going into the site formation theme again, what are the impacts on cultural resource um, uh, site formation processes? What do they bring to the site? What do they take away? Um, are they using these sites for sleep um, sleeping sites, as the researchers call them. Um, the other types of impacts might be beach fauna, ostriches, zebra, and all the others um, in the park. Uh, so in 2014, um, East Carolina uh, University, this was June, July of last year, um, uh, offered a summer abroad. This included both graduate and undergraduate students, um, both traditional as well as maritime archaeology. And our research themes were somewhat broad, um, a maritime landscape, particularly a military maritime landscape. Uh, we looked at local and global connections being a strategic uh, venue between the Indian Ocean world and the Atlantic Ocean world. And then with this um, theme of tourism, which is the economic uh, foundation for South Africa, uh, memory and legacy. What are the iconic sites? Uh, what are the meanings in the state park, um, uh, national park, uh, that people connect with? I think you're going to find this uh, fairly interesting. Um, sources with field data, archaeological work, both underwater and on land. Um, primary sources like ship logbooks, newspapers, um, cultural memor memorabilia, often tourist curios, uh, photographic collections, oral histories, and park management reports. Um, so starting off with early uh, heritage, uh, visitors uh, came uh, really from the 1800s onwards. Um, they came on horseback, in automobiles. Uh, they um, walked along the paths, viewed the wildlife, hunted the wildlife, including the ostriches. And this include, included many of the crew from the local ships. Um, uh, there was also uh, a fear of the danger, again, um, and uh, liability. Um, so as you can see from the sign there, any person found rolling down the cliff would be prosecuted. Quite frankly, I don't know if they'd be alive to prosecute, but anyway. Um, and then um, just a, a plethora of photographic images, and this shows um, the opening of the, the so-called new lighthouse in 1919, uh, 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 which was attended by the local mayor uh, of Simonstown on his horse. Lighthouses are by far the most um, popular tourist attraction, both in the past and in the present. Um, the old lighthouse, you saw that in that video clip, uh, was built in 1857. It was 268 meters above the sea level. Um, it was way too high and completely um, uh, non-functional. It was covered in cloud and fog. And as a result, none of the ships could see it. And in fact, uh, a Lusitania Portuguese vessel went down in 19. Uh, 11, right below the lighthouse, and that was the tipping point. They built a new one in, in 1914. This was 87 meters above sea, sea level, so from kind of 600 feet to 300 feet. Um, and this currently is functional as the brightest light in South Africa and visible 60 kilometers out to sea. Um, the uh, point was also an excellent uh, promontory to view passing shipping, not only to view passing shipping because of the proximity of the Simonstown naval base, uh, but also military escapades, um, including that of the iconic uh, ship, the CSS Alabama, um, the Confederate raider um, that chased and captured the Sea Bride um, in full viewpoint of jubilant um, throngs of crowds on the table, uh, on the mountains of uh, Simonstown, um, and later took it back uh, to uh, Table Bay uh, to uh, 
even further uh, crowds and were welcomed in. And this is a, a well-known um, painting showing the mountain range in the background, the Confederate flag, which is then uh, stored in the South African Museum, and of course signage in the park. Um, Raffle Sims was the captain uh, of the CSS Alabama, um, and uh, this was one of his favorite anchorages. He claimed the Cape made some of the, the best sails. Um, he would uh, have beach parties, uh, barbecues, or rather brides, um, and sell off some of the uh, prizes from the Union vessels to the Cape locals. Um, uh, and uh, uh, not all the uh, crew of the Alabama went home. Some of them stayed on, others died um, in hunting accidents with ostriches, apparently. Uh, one of which was um, uh, the chief engineer, um, and he was buried in a local farm, tended to by the farmer. And uh, after 131 years, uh, decided to send the remains home. There were over a thousand South Africans present waving Confederate flags. Um, and uh, supportive of this um, event. Um, and not only that, singing um, a song, uh, which is second to none, the most popular song in South Africa, even more so than our national anthem, I would say, <laughs> um, called Dark Home de Alibama. And uh, this um, uh, song uh, is taught to children from grade one uh, onwards. It's usually sung in Afrikaans in various contexts, both in formal, choral uh, situations with young Afrikaner, a white woman, but also in more festival occasions by um, Cape Malay uh, band. These are descendants of the slaves. Um, and I have, if you have time, if you want to, I can let you hear those. Anyway, um, the Alabama um, uh, crew were not the only ones who lingered longer in the Cape Town. Um, other uh, groups uh, associated with Cape Point uh, were survivors of shipwrecks um, at this in this very um, uh, dangerous environment along the cliffs of Cape Point, um, and deserters, many of them from American vessels, um, who uh, left and joined fishing communities as a, uh, a strong component of Filipinos, um, who uh, deserted um, in the 1860s and early 1900s, um, and uh, began to uh, work with whaling communities and fishing communities, first in Cape Point, and later on, um, moved to small fishing towns like uh, Kalk Bay. Um, and these uh, groups of people today include um, a plethora of ethnicities, uh, language groups. Um, they uh, include black Africans, white Africans, um, and they still practice traditional fishing um, in these small boats, hand lining uh, without reels, pulling these um, uh, barracuda-like fish, um, the snook up, um, and selling them on the wharves um, to uh, the local public. So this is sort of a continuation of that Cape Point uh, tourism. Um, the other members of these communities um, who served on these uh, vessels and now part of the, the fishing communities are the crewmen in the Cedis. Uh, the crewmen uh, came from West Africa, typically Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia. Uh, the Cedis from the Swahili coast, um, uh, the Madagascar area, Tanzania, Mozambique, and they were um, enlisted seamen on board the vessels. Uh, they also served in a variety of roles, including uh, uh, coaling, uh, working in the engine rooms, um, chefs, musicians, uh, but uh, many of them also retired um, in the Cape area, um, in Simon's Town and Falls Bay. And a nostalgic reminder of these uh, is the Navy burial ground, Seaforth, uh, where you can see the headstones uh, that uh, uh, you know, tell you the story about these uh, seamen. Tom Peters, number two, crewman, uh, and number one, often named after the vessel they served on, or mantle aboard the, the ship. Uh, shipwrecks, and these were often deserters or survivors, came from a variety of um, uh, ships of different nationalities and vintages um, in Cape Point Preserve. Um, and today, to uh, enhance the tourism, there is a shipwreck trail named after the Thomas Tucker, which we're going to hear about next. American Liberty ship, um, and uh, this was the venue for our, uh, one of our field projects. Um, the uh, trail, Shipwreck Trail, is one of many. There's a geological trail, um, a nature trail. Um, they have ones that are dedicated to particular um, animal species, and uh, this uh, trail can be anywhere from two to four hours. Um, the only visible shipwreck remains uh, on land, and that is the Thomas Tucker um, at Olivo Bons, uh, co uh Point, and then the North in 1864. The others are all submerged underwater. Um, there's a considerable amount of anecdotal diver information about the, um, the remains, mainly cannons and anchors. Um, there are also other sites, uh, which include 
uh, forts, World War II radar stations, um, and um, a number of, of grave sites of these uh, fishing communities. Um, although the uh, shipwrecks have not been uh, studied um, in any depth or systematically surveyed, there's definitely an awareness um, of, of the vessels and um, branding, really, in the tourism uh, industry at the Cape Point um, logo shop, Two Oceans, as you saw. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, there's a takeaway pizza joint. Every pizza is named after a different shipwreck. Um, oh. They are also um, multiple types of objects like uh, shot glasses and coffee cups named after Confederate vessels. And you can see here, see, I think Nathan has the entire set. Um, the funicular, the little um, train you saw going up the hill, is named after shipwrecks. Um, it's named after the Thomas Tucker, American uh, Liberty ship, and uh, the Flying Dutchman, which is a ghost ship that comes past Cape Point. Um, apart from the shipwrecks, the other popular um, cultural attractions are uh, forts. These were observation points um, dug into the hills, um, block houses, simple uh, cement uh, structures, um, and then secret radar stations. There were 50 of these um, in the Cape Town area. Three of them were in the Cape Point, um, two of them directly below the old uh, lighthouse, um, and uh, these were uh, instrumental in uh, detecting the conning towers of the submarines by passing the Cape. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to that, um, looking at the photographic imagery related to World War II, uh, a lot of very interesting uh, postcards. This is one of the ones that, that really interested me because it sort of brings together this wildlife components and marine life uh, in South Africa. And so you can see, um, uh, this was not put in by myself as part of the postcard. Um, they've taken a, a scale from figure uh, on board the uh, submarine and show you two dorsal fins of a great white shark, um, which is by their estimate, 64 feet. So, and, uh, well, yeah, this is the breeding ground of the great white shark. Um, so just in conclusion, um, future research um, and the theme is sort of heritage at risk, historic preservation and promoting uh, sustainable site tourism. Um, the idea is uh, future shipwreck surveys along the shipwreck trail, uh, both underwater and on land, um, looking at uh, site formation processes such as the impact of wildlife, um, mapping and recording historic structures, um, lighthouses, observation forts, World War II radar stations, and then another um, new component for us, which is oral histories, ethnographic and small watercraft um, in these Colt Bay fishing communities and connections to the uh, Cape Point uh, community. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, sand parks, um, great accommodations, um, Cape Tours that helped us with logistics, um, Jim Smales from Mars, um, and of course, East Carolina University for supporting um, our exotic um, research. So, thank you.